Um, hi, my name's Anne Thula and I'm a third year medical student at St George's. Um, and today I'm going to just be going through a little bit of um, kidney biology, um, mainly focusing on the stuff you need to know for your A-levels, but also just a little bit of background uh, knowledge for like if you were thinking of doing anything medicine related as well. So um, the learning objectives, so I just put in the red are the learning objectives for A-levels. So this is what you're expected to know for A-levels. So you're meant to know the um, overview of the anatomy and functions of the kidney, structure of a nephron and its role in the formation of glomerular filtrate, reabsorption of glucose and water at the proximal convoluted tubule, maintaining a gradient of sodium ions in the medulla of the loop of Henle, and reabsorption of water by the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. And then in relation to that, the role of the hypothalamus, posterior pituitary, and a hormone called antidiuretic hormone in osmoregulation. So that's water balance control. And then if we have time, I've also put a few extra little bits just to bring the kidney um, into focus a bit more as a whole holistic picture of it. It's also got some endocrine functions, um, how we measure kidney function in terms of glomerular filtration rate, and then also just a little bit around clinical ne nephrology. So first question, and we'll put up a poll. What does the kidney do? So does it get rid of waste materials? Does it have a role in fluid balance? Does it assist in um, drug metabolism and excretion? Um, does it has a, have a role in bone metabolism and blood cell production or all of the above? So feel free to vote on that. Great. Yeah, so absolutely all of the above. And this was just put there just so that you can kind of see that the kidney does a lot and it's so important and it's very, very complicated, but I'm gonna try my best to break it down uh, as much as possible. Okay. Okay, so functions of the kidney. So the ones you need to know, let me see if I can get a cursor up actually. Um, I don't know, can people see my mouse actually? Amelia, can you see my mouse? Yeah, we can see that. Oh, perfect, cool. So I don't, need a, don't need a cursor then, fine. Okay, so um, the ones you need to know for A-level are control of solutes and fluids and pretty much the volume, composition of volume and body fluids and getting risk, rid of waste materials is important as well, meta uh, metabolic waste excretion. This one, drug, drug metabolism, you don't really get tested on. Acid-base balance, you don't either. Um, blood pressure control, I think you have to kind of have awareness, but not really in that much detail. Um, but then it does a lot of other things as well. So it does bone metabolism that we'll go into and uh, helps with red blood cell production um, and yeah, acid base balance, like I just said. So that's fine. Cool. So those are the overview of the roles of the functional kidney. So just to put it into anatomical relevance, I guess. So these are your kidneys. We've got two. Um, they sit, I mean, they sit basically at the level of what we call L1, which is your lumbar spine, the, the lumbar part of your spine. Um, but essentially, if you place your hands on your hip um, and your thumbs are in like the, basically the approximate position of your kidneys, um, they are supplied by basically these renal arteries here that come off of the abdominal aorta. So once the aorta comes out from the heart and goes down, as soon as it gets through the diaphragm, that becomes the abdomen, abdominal aorta. And the blood supply from the kidneys comes off of this. Uh, these little things that are sitting on there like party hats are your um, adrenal glands. And then you've essentially got your ureters coming down. So urine is gonna come through here. And this is your bladder where your urine is stored. So urine's made in the kidney, but stored in the bladder. And then bladder outlet here in the urethra to come out when you go, go for a wee. And in terms of blood supply, it goes back through the um, infer inferior vena cava, which is this blue, big blue vessel that's going to go back up, back up to the heart. Okay, so the structure of the actual kidney itself. So if you've got a kidney and kind of sliced it, that this is oh, sorry this is what you'd see um so there's just 
various parts. So you've got the cortex, which is like the outer layer, the darker layer, and that's dense, full of capillaries. Um, just need to, I'm gonna minimize myself because I can't see. <laughs> Fine, yeah, uh, at the side, yeah. And then the medulla here is the lighter area. And that's where loads and loads of your subunits, known as nephrons, that's where the tubules are and that's where the collecting ducts are. Uh, this is your renal pelvis. That's the innermost part of the kidney. And that's where uh, urine is collected before it passes down the ureter. And then, like we said, the ureter is here and then the bladder at the end. So I'll just put that there for you to look back up. Um, also, if there's any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat as we go. Happy to answer anything or unmute and ask more than happy to answer. So this is your nephron. This is the bread and butter of A-level biology. You have to know the nephron. So we're going to break it down as best as we can. So this is an overview. So this is your Bowman's capsule. Uh, this is basically where all the filtration happens. And this is your glomerulus. And the glomerulus is basically a massive tangle of small capillaries of blood, basically, that's going to go in here and it's going to filter it. And lots of things are going to go into the nephron. To make it really simple, anything that's in the nephron by the end is what's going to end up in your urine. Anything that leaves the nephron once it goes in, it's going to go back into the blood and then back into normal circulation. So we're going to go through each bit in, in turn. So that's the first part. Um, then you've got this bit, so this purple part is called the proximal convoluted tubule. And convoluted just means that it kind of tangles around, coils around. So that's a good way of remembering it. Um, then you've got your loop of Henley. So this is your loop of Henley. You've got a thick, um, <clears throat> you've got a thin descending limb a thin ascending limb, and then you've got a thick ascending limb here as well. And we're going to again talk about that a bit later, but that's basically where all the concentration of your urine happens. And then this part here, the pink bit, is your distal convoluted tubule. And then this part here is your collecting duct. Um, and your distal and, and collecting duct is essentially where um, water balance tends to happen in terms of just fine tuning your urine. So if you're really, really heat dehydrated, you're going to, you're going to want to keep more water. Whereas if you've drunk lots and lots and lots and you need to pee, you're going to have lots more water in your urine. So that's where that kind of tells the kidney what to do. So we're going to go through each bit. But before we do that, I just want to explain a principle. And this is a specific, this is not in your course so don't worry if you don't understand it but it kind of will really help in terms of just any sort of balance fluid balance fluid movement and it's a principle that's really important in, in medicine and this is the starlings principle of fluid exchange so essentially this is your blood this is a blood capillary and this is the interstitial fluid so the fluid outside of the cells um, and if you think about it you've got a pressure coming down and that pressure is going to exert a force that's going to want to squeeze your fluid out. And that's what we call a hydrostatic pressure. But also inside your blood, you've got big proteins. You've got plasma, you've got uh, plasma proteins, you've got albumin, you've got red blood cells. And they exert a force as well, uh, which is an osmotic force known as oncotic pressure. And those kind of want to draw fluid back in. So that's just an important concept to think about when you're thinking about fluid movement, which way things are moving and balancing those. And it's the balance of these two fluids that is, it, that, um, is behind your fluid movement within different compartments. So the glomerulus. So this is your glomerulus. Yeah, so this is your bone. The glomerulus is made up of your Bowman's capsule. Yeah, and then your glomerulus capillaries here. Um, you've got an afferent arterial that comes in. So A, A is first in the alphabet, so that's the first one that's going to come in. And then you've got an efferent arterial, and that's where blood leaves. Okay. So when this blood comes in, afferent, so we what we were just saying earlier was that you've got high pressure because it's a it's a capillary, and then they're getting narrower, so you're going to increase that pressure. And that high pressure is going to squeeze fluid out, fluid's moving out. There are proteins in here too, but overall the pressure going out is more. So as we know from osmosis, 
uh, fluid is going to move from a high pressure to a low pressure. So fluid's going to move out. It squeezes everything into this Bowman's capsule. So everything goes out there. Um, things like ions, small things, basically. And you'll see why in a minute, why it's small things. But that's the principle of ultrafiltration. It's called ultrafiltration because it's not, it doesn't specifically pick things that's going to come in and out. It literally just squeezes everything small that it can come out. And this is just a diagram that's highlighting that. And you can read that as well in your own time. And this is how the glomerulus is kind of set up and how it kind of picks what's going to go in and out. So it's got, you've got three layers to it. You've got this capillary endothelium layer. Um, and that's got small, tiny, like circular holes, what we call fenestrations in it. And that's how things can get through. So things like bit red blood cells, they're too big. They're going to come straight back out. But other things are going to go through that endothelial layer. And then you've got a basement membrane. So the basement membrane isn't made up of, um, is a, is, hasn't got like um, big holes in it, but it's got like a network, like a fibre, like a mesh, basically tangled like that. Um, and I think it's got um, specific charges as well that kind of bounce things away as well. So things like, a, you don't need to know the protein, but something, this is called fibrinogen, that can go through the first layer that can't go through the basement membrane, so it goes back out. And then you've got this third layer that then enhances it even more. And this is your um, layer actually of the nephron itself, so the Bowman's capsule. And it's got these cells known as podocytes, and podocytes just means feet. So they kind of look like foot-like projections um, and they've got tiny holes here as well. They're really, really, really tiny and that sm stops smaller proteins like albumin, which is a really important protein in the blood actually. Um, that stops that from leaking through because we don't want protein in the blood. Protein in the blood means like it, there's a problem with the kidneys and you don't want that. Um, so yeah, so things that will get through are very small ions, small amino acids, um, water, glucose, those kind of things. So quick question, and I'm happy for you to unmute or write it in the chat, um, and Amelia will let me know what's going on. But I've just put an A-level question in just to show you the relevance. Um, so the question is, Alport syndrome is an inherited disorder that affects kidney glomeruli of both men and women. Affected individuals have proteinuria, which is high protein, high quantities of protein in the urine, suggest how AS could cause proteinuria. So either unmute or write in the chat, whatever you feel. Give it a go. Sorry, I was trying to find the chat. Um, oh, that's okay. It's very awkward that it's just me. <laughs> That's um, okay, don't worry, Ellie. Don't worry, I'm here too. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it together. So what are you thinking in terms of Alport yeah. syndrome? Um, to, be, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> no, that's, so, that's okay. So we were talking about protein earlier, weren't we? Yeah. We're talking about protein and why is it the protein what stops the protein from actually getting out in the urine in the first place based on what we've said so far the base layer of i've forgotten the name of it already that's okay the basement thinking, layer within the cell exactly we're thinking exactly the basement remember we're thinking about the layers of the glomerulus aren't we so that's your first port of call that's what's going to stop protein from getting through so that's the the region of the nephron we're talking about right um, and that's essentially what it's asking you. You, do, you don't need to know about Alport syndrome. You don't need to know what it does or anything. All you know right now is that there's protein in the urine. What's causing protein in the urine? Protein shouldn't be in the urine. And what stops it, if I go back, is, the, it, is these layers, is these structures. So you've got like one layer here, then another layer and another layer. And if you've got a problem with any of these layers, you're going to have stuff leaking through that shouldn't be leaking through. So that's another thing with like, if you see blood in the urine, you know, mm -hmm. that's going to be a problem. Blood shouldn't be getting into the urine. If that's getting in the urine again, you know that there's a problem with this area. Yeah. And so that, the, that would, yeah. that would indicate there's some kind of default within the cells themselves. Correct. Within exactly. the layers. Okay. Exactly. There's a damage to that layer. Exactly. And that's all they're trying to get you to understand. Um, so that's two marks and I put the mark scheme there. So all it says, you know, there's damage to the basement membrane. So there's more protein coming through the basement membrane and then protein passes into the tubule and then goes out basically. So 
that's you know that's all it's asking so you don't need to know the condition but you need to be able to kind of think about what's what part of the kidney what part of my nephron is there damage okay right okay good well done that's really really good so next part of the kidney so just to reorientate we're going to talk about this part here the proximal convoluted tube so everything's been filtrated out into the bowman's capsule so it's now inside the nephron so then what so you've got um, the proximal convoluted tubule, and that's where selective reabsorption happens. So actually 65%, 70% of your reabsorption of everything pretty much happens at this part. So it's a really important part of the, of the nephron. So all your glucose is reabsorbed, amino acids, vitamins, because all these things our body still needs. We don't want to get rid of it. We want it back. Um, so it needs to come back, including some water as well, we said glucose yeah and then also some actually urea comes back through as well um so yeah so how is it adapted so you've got lots and lots of microvilli so i am um, i don't know if you've learned so far but maybe um about surface area so when things are folded you've got a higher surface area they're also one membrane thick so all of these things are make it quicker for diffusion to happen or any sort of transport to happen across it um, so that's why that's important. It's got lots and lots of co-transporter proteins, so proteins that are going to help things come across, um, across the membrane, back into the blood. Lots and lots of mitochondria, because a lot of this is going to need energy. Um, there's something called a sodium potassium pump on the cells, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, and that requires energy. So you need mitochondria to do that. Um, and the cells are tightly packed together, so fluid can't pass through. So this is what I mean. So this is the base. This is basically the blood cells, so blood layer. And then this is your nephron. So this is the proximal convoluted tube. Well, this is a cell of that. You can see there's lots and lots of microvilli, loads and loads of foldings here. So that increases surface area. And you can see our sodium potassium pump here. So sodium potassium, it pumps sodium out, potassium in. And that sets up what we call our concentration gradient. So sodium's coming over back into the blood. You're decreasing the concentration there, um, concentration in the cell. So sodium's going to come into the cell. So you're going to reabsorb sodium. And then with this sodium, glucose is a co-transporter. Sodium, because it's transporting two things, sodium and then glucose or amino acids, whichever one. Usually there's a co-transporter with sodium and any other thing. So glucose, amino acid, that kind of thing. Um, and this is where basically everything gets put, put all back into the blood. So you need this. This is a really important pump to set up that concentration gradient. And that's going to drive everything else from where the lumen is. This is the nephron, basically, the inside the nephron. We want it all back in. So it's going to drive everything back in. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and this diagram kind of shows you what's active and what's passive transport. So if you think back to like GCSE biology, active transport, you need energy. So this is actively being transported, this sodium into the blood. Um, and then passive transport is going from high concentration to low concentration. So because we've pumped sodium out, we've reduced that concentration gradient inside the cell. So that means sodium is going to diffuse into the cell from the proximal tubule lumen. Okay, this is our dreaded loop of Henley. Um, everyone hates this and I completely understand why it's a horrible, horrible thing to kind of get your head around. So we said descending limb, ascending limb. And it's sometimes easier to start with the ascending limb actually. Um, so this ascending limb is impermeable to water. So you can see this line or, and this whole ascending limb basically is impermeable to water, meaning water can't get through, okay? So if we think about here, the proximal convoluted tubule, we've pumped all the ions back into the blood, right? So all that's left really in here is majority water. We've kind of, we've gotten rid of all the ions in here. So we've got a high concentration of water inside this, and it's gonna come down this descending loop of Henle. And this part of the convoluted tubule is permeable to water. So what's water going to want to do? If you've got a high concentration of water inside, it's going to want to move out. 
So water comes out, okay? And the ascending limb is impermeable to water cleverly because well, what you don't want is that water to then come back in because that defeats the purpose. We want the water. We don't want to get rid of all of our water. We want our water to go back into our blood. So that ascending limb stops that water from going back in. And it does one extra thing. It pumps this sodium chloride out um, and that decreases the concentration gradient further to then bring more water out of this part of the leucopenoly. So it's quite a clever mechanism and it sets up that concentrated creation gradient really nicely for things to move out of the nephron and into the blood. And you'll see that nicer here. So if this is your blood and this is the loop of Henley, you can see how thing, the water's moving out here into the blood, but you've got sodium chloride moving out here that's going to reduce that gradient to bring more water out of this part and it's all going to nicely go into that blood. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Are there any questions so far? I'll just pause actually. Do you have any questions? Not at the moment. I think I'm following for the most part. <laughs> yeah, okay. If you have anything, let me know. It is a complicated thing. And this is actually something you learn in your second year of A-level rather than first year of A-level. So okay. it, is a, it is hard to kind of get heads around. So hopefully okay. that. I'm definitely going to be reviewing the video afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. No problem. Okay. Distal convoluted tubule. So again, just to reorientate. So we're now we're going to just talk about this part, the distal convoluted, and then the collecting duct. So we're going to try to treat it as a whole thing on its own for this for this point. So this fine tunes. So we've spoken about how solutes get back in. So glucose, amino acids, that's how this is how that gets back in. We've spoken about how water gets reabsorbed, but then what happens at the uh, distal convoluted tubule and your collecting duct is that water gets modulated because if you think about it, you never pee and end up with the exact same concentration or the exact same volume of pee every time you pee. It very much depends on our thirst, on our drinking and all of that. Um, so it's two twofolds. So you've got a higher level organization of that up in the brain that we're going to talk through and we're going to talk about what actually happens at the level of the kidney to modulate that as well so water balance is really really important um so if we our water levels drop um and we get end up dehydrated that gets detected by a tiny little area of the brain called the hypothalamus and that hypothalamus causes us to feel thirsty okay um, and this, and it also triggers um, another part of the brain called the pituitary gland, but it's specifically the posterior pituitary. Um, the pituitary has basically got two parts to it, posterior part and an anterior part. So all that means is back and front. Um, so the posterior part, the back of it, releases a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. And if you know what diuresis means or diuretic, meaning to pee loads, to get rid of water, antidiuretic is going to do the opposite, which makes sense because if your water levels dropped, you want to rain, may, retain water. So this antidiuretic hormone then acts on the kidney um, and it acts here at, this, at the distal convoluted tubules and the collecting duct. It acts there, so you can see, this is blood filled with antidiuretic hormone. And it acts on here. And what it does is it tells the cells, we need more water. It releases these channels. So this like vesicle fill it channels so all these little things are channels. It goes to the side of the membrane, fuses, and now you've got water channels and they're called aquaporins. And these water channels are gonna take up water and bring water back into the blood. So that's what ADH does. And then the opposite happens if we have too much water. So essentially we just switch off that ADH and then the kidneys will re reabsorb less water and then more water will be in the urine. So if we've drunk lots and lots and lots and we're actually like fluid overloaded, we kind of need to, get rid of that water so it'd be like no no more adh and then we get rid of that water okay so another quick question um and once you're asking that i'm just gonna switch the light on because i think it's getting dark okay so have a think it's an a-level style question again so it says um inhibits the absorption of sodium and chloride 
from the filtrate produced in the nephrons, explain how furosemide causes an increase in the volume of urine produced. So don't worry if you can't answer this. It's just an example to kind of be like, how they could test you in an exam. You don't have to be expected to answer this right now. Um, but have a think and just think what you think might be, might be the, the reason. I think it would be worth mentioning um, to kind of guide your thinking on this one, uh, that if we're, if, if furosemide is inhibiting the absorption of sodium and chloride, then what's gonna happen to the concentration of sodium and chloride in the filtrate if they're not being reabsorbed? Is the concentration gonna go up? Is it gonna go down? And then yeah. what does that mean in terms of osmosis and, and where the water's gonna move? Maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, if, I think what your thinking is, and then I'll talk it through. If I'm, it. if I'm understanding it correctly, then if it inhibits the absorption of the sodium and the chloride, uh, the chloride, then there'd be a higher concentration of them. Yeah, and therefore a higher pressure when it comes to the water being filtered out, and the water would be more likely to be filtered out, and therefore create more urine. No. No, I see, I see what you're trying to say. It's, it's a good thought. It's a good thought. Let's go back to, the, to this. So sodium chloride. So sodium chloride is pumped out of this loop of Henle. And that what that does is that creates a gradient. So if we've got if we've got sodium chloride in here, lots and lots of salt, right, is the concentration here of water high or low if we've got more salt here? Low. Correct. So where is water going to be more, where, where's the concentration of water going to be more? If, if, if it's low here, it's going to be more inside the tube, isn't it? Yes. So that's going to, which way is water going to want to move? It's going to want to move out. Exactly. So that's, so that's what we mean by reabsorbed. So anything that's coming out of the nephron is going to be reabsorbed back into the blood. Anything that stays in the nephron goes in the urine, right? Right, okay. So this sodium chloride, like, we, like you said perfectly, gets pumped out into this space that lowers the concentration of water in that space, which then drives water out. Yeah? Right, okay. So we're reabsorbing water. So what happens if we completely block that mechanism? So what happens if we block that sodium chloride reabsorption? If it's not reabsorbed, then it doesn't drive the water out and the water stays in and then you pee more. There we go. Excellent. Right. Okay. Uh, you've got it. Bang on. That's exactly it. So that's exactly what's happening. It's perfect. So water potential is decreased, less water by osmosis, and it ends up in the collection tube, so you get more urine. Well done. Good. So clinical relevance of that question is furosemide is actually a drug we use. Um, as a diuretic um, to basically either get rid of fluid if someone's fluid overloaded, if they're in heart failure or something like that, but also um, but we don't use furosemide for it. But in terms of blood pressures, we can use drugs, we can target the kidney to reduce blood pressure. Because if you've got too much fluid um, or to reduce blood pressure, if we have less fluid going around our body, we reduce that blood pressure. So we can get rid of things um, doing it that way. So we, we can target this area with a thiazide drug, um, there's some other drugs, there's this one we can target, and then there's this one we target for diabetics, but you don't need to worry about that. The main takeaway is that we can target the kidney and different parts of the kidney based on our knowledge of that nephron to modulate the water balance and ion balance in the body when it comes to, to, to diseases. So I hope that kind of brings it a bit more into um, context. So if you've got someone with really high blood pressure, would you want to give a drug that um, like retains water or gets rid of it? Gets rid of it. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. Uh, so it's just, just also putting into fact that they don't just make up drugs 
they hatch this is actually a drug um so the a levels are testing you on things that are will be relevant later if you were to okay. go into medicine okay i love that <laughs> okay so this is extra stuff so you just act, like absorb this don't focus on it too much um we'll probably finish early and you can ask more questions about the actual a level knowledge as well so don't worry but this is just to put into context you don't need to know this i've just put diagrams to make it prettier but um kidney also has a function in red blood cell production so it makes a something called um erythropoietin um and then when you end up like hypoxic so when there's like low oxygen levels your, your body's like crap can't get more more oxygen oh i know what i'm going to do i'm going to make more red blood cells to take up more oxygen um so the kidney re pre, um, releases epo and that acts on the bone marrow to then mature red blood cells and make more more blood cells to increase that oxygen demand um it has a role in blood pressure um regulation again something you don't need to know yet but it, re it releases something called renin so re renin is released from the kidney and it acts on this pathway um, to increase blood pressure. And actually it kind of regulates back on itself in a way because it causes the um, adrenal glands to release something called aldosterone, which then acts on the kidney to then reuptake more ions and water as well. So it's, it's just a mechanism to kind of increase blood pressure if your blood pressure falls. And we can target this for blood pressure. This is actually this is the system we really do target for blood pressure, um, which is great. And then also calcium metabolism. So vitamin D is very, very important for our bones. But what people don't know is that vitamin D has two ways, it, two ways that it needs to be activated. It gets partially activated by the liver, but it actually needs the kidney to have a fully active form. And if the kidney is not functioning, then it can't activate vitamin D. So you don't get reabsorption of calcium. Um, so, because this vitamin D is what's needed to act on the, your gut to reabsorb calcium. Um, so yeah, so it's really important for that. So what you'd see in like a, a kidney disease that's been going on for a really long time is you'd might see anemia because the, the, which just means low hemoglobin, um, because it's not producing EPO. You might see, uh, problems with blood pressure. So you might see a high blood pressure because this is getting react simulated way too much. And you also might see bone breakdown. So an, osteo, um, an osteoporotic kind of way, where basically you've got like thin bones. Um, and um, yeah, because it's not activating vitamin D. So if you're not getting calcium from the gut, it needs to break down the bone to get calcium. So you get really thin bones, which causes you to maybe get more like breakages and stuff if you fell over. So you, in elderly people, if you're thinking that. And then just a little bit about what, how we measure kidney function. So we measure something called glomerular filtrate rate, filtration rate. So the glomerular filtrate is just the fluid that's in the glomerulus. So in this part, when it gets filtered, filtered in. And the rate that happens is essentially like how, like how much fluid is getting filtered in, in a certain time. And we assess that by measuring the clearance of a substance. Um, and we use creatinine to measure that. So creatinine is a, is a substance that's uh, found in the body and it's produced during muscle metabolism. So breakdown of uh, muscle. Um, and it's kind of basically, it's, it is freely, freely filtered to a point. Some of it is actually kind of released from the kidney itself. So it's not a true measure, um, but it can be. So essentially, if you think about it, if you've got a GFR, so if glomerular filtration rate, that's high, creatinine is going to be freely filtered. So it's going to be basically leaving in the urine. So a low, you don't want to find creatinine in the blood, basically. Um, so if you've got, if you measure creatinine in the blood and it's high, it's inversely proportional to the GFR. So you're thinking, okay, if my creatinine's high, that means my GFR is probably too low. It's not filtering it out properly. And that's telling us that kidney isn't functioning very well. Um, so it's just something that we look at when we're measuring kidney function, and it's actually a really, really important marker. There are other ones, but this is one that we, we really do look at. Um, and then just, just an overview of kidney disease. I'm not going to go into it, and please don't stress about it. Um, it's just basically kind of saying that you can have something called an acute kidney injury, which is just like there and then you just damage your kidney, but it's reversible. So something like a dehydration can cause you to get a kidney injury. 
Um, and if that's not treated, then it can, can lead to like an acute kidney disease. So short term, basically a short kidney disease. So kidney damage, I think it's under three months. Um, and if that goes on for longer, so over three months, then it becomes a chronic kidney disease. Um, uh, so something like diabetes, diabetes can cause a chronic kidney disease. And we don't really tend to see chronic kidney diseases. They're quite slow. We don't really see them until later when they actually are quite bad. Whereas something like a, an acute kidney injury, a really quick, quick um, problem with the kidney, we're going to see there and then when it's happened. So if someone's really, really dehydrated and they've collapsed and we measure their kidney functions, so we measure their GFR, we measure all these things, creatinine, we're going to see that there's a problem with the kidneys and then we can treat and reverse it. Um, so that's that. Uh, we've actually got 15 minutes. So do you have any questions on anything that we've gone so far that I can talk back over? Um, not that you've gone through so far, but one of, well, you may have touched on it and I've, I'm, okay. apologies if I've missed it. Um, glucose in the kidney. I know that one of the um, causes of kidney disease can be diabetes, but I'm a little confused on how the two are linked. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so let me find a picture that might be useful. One of the pictures I've used probably of the, of the nephron. Let me go back to the nephron. Okay, so, so glucose, um, if you have too much glucose in your blood, it kind of damages these layers. Um, so it damages kind of, it damages the glomerulus. Um, it also damages, I think, the proximal convoluted tubule as well. And if you think about it, so you've got a channel, I actually did show it briefly. It's on the drug channel that we've used here. So there's this channel here. Okay, and that's a sodium glucose transporter, SGLT2. So Glucose gets reabsorbed back into the blood, but if you've, you've got like a, a limited amount of these transporters on the, on the surface of your convoluted tubule. So once those are completely saturated, you're not going to get any more glucose coming through. So what we tend to see in diabetes is actually because not all the glucose is getting reabsorbed because we've overrided this system, glucose ends up in the urine. Does that make sense? So that's like a marker of diabetes. You've got too much glucose in the blood to the point where it's not getting, you can't reabsorb it all. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then it damages the glomerulus in itself, lots of, lots of glucose. It just damage, it just basically messes up the kidney. It completely damages this. Um, it also does things further up the system on the heart, which kind of increases the blood pressure. And the, the kidney is really sensitive to blood pressure. So if you don't have enough blood going to it, you end up in AKI, so acute kidney injury, that's dehydration. It needs to be, it, it really loves to have um, perfusion. It really wants blood. But equally, if you have too high a pressure going through that system, these cells are really sensitive to it and will die. And then you lose the, the, the filtration here. So you end up damaging that basement membrane that we loved talking about earlier. So this domain gets, you, you lose that and you end up with, with protein um, in the in the urine and something else we look at is our albumin creatinine ratio it's what we call it so we look at how much albumin we've got in um versus how much creatinine we've got um in the blood and if you've lose if you're losing albumin it's quite bad it's quite um you get end up with like protein in the urine that's the thing that happens in, in diabetes and we use that actually to stage um kidney disease um so yeah Right. Okay. That makes a lot more sense now. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Um, no, I, I don't think so. No. No. Are you happy with the, how, how the parts of the nephron work? That's the main thing to take away. And the, they're all on the slides anyway, so you can have a look back later. I will definitely be looking back later. Yes. Um, yeah. I'll be going through this probably a couple of times just to, uh, just to bring it, myself up to it speed. It is a lot to do in an hour, honestly. And even people, if it helps you in any way, people on our course even struggle with the kidney to this day. So it's oh, not. Right. It is, <laughs> I think it's very mean at the level that they make you do at A level. Let you know, like we have to know it, it to the same level. Actually, in fact, at at um uni level. So right. Okay, that makes. Uh... That makes that, that makes sense and also makes me a little nervous about potentially looking at nephrology. <laughs> oh, well, is this something you're interested in? Um, it, it is, yes. Um, oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, honestly, once you get your head around it, it's actually a really lovely um, thing to do because it actually, if it, um, 
it relates to loads of different diseases, not just kidney diseases. Mm. Literally, your kidneys are so important. They impact literally every organ in the body. Um, so once you kind of understand that, understand this part, this is the key thing. So the key thing to know is ultrafiltration here, selective reabsorption here. Your loop of Henle is going to set up that concentration gradient for your water to get reabsorbed. So water back into the blood. And these are modulators. Um, and once you get your head around those, that's it. You can pretty much answer anything. Brilliant. Thank you. This has been oh, really enlightening. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, like Anthea was saying, um, the thing to focus on really is what's reabsorbed where. And um, that's quite a useful useful one to get your head around, especially the loop of Henley. And that's like the main powerhouse of water reabsorption. Um, and then that triple filtrate, um, the the triple layer of the um, like the basement membrane, the basement membrane the yeah. and the um, in the glomerulus, um, it, kind of where it all starts, and you've got the water being pushed through the wall, um, sort of like when you push flour through a sieve, it's that kind of thing. You've got the high pressure inside the blood vessel pushing the water. Uh, and anything that's dissolved in it through the walls of the capillaries, through the basement membrane, through the podocytes, through those three different sieves effectively out into the into the Bowman's capsule. That was a, another big topic that they like to focus on a lot. Um, and I love that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they do a love fun that. fact as well, just because I was going to say, sorry, a fun fact as well, because I know sometimes they like to ask about other animals in A-levels. I can't remember if they still do it, uh, but I remember learning or had to learn so um desert animals so they like to talk about like desert rats and desert mice um desert animals really need to maintain their water right because there's not enough water around um for them to get to so actually they have longer loop of penleys than us um so our loop of penleys are quite long but they've got longer ones because that means the longer your um loop of henley the more concentrated you can get your urine and they want to get their urine a lot more concentration than us because they want to keep water a lot more than us. So actually the length of those loop and Henleys is really important for um, water concentration. So if you ever see a question in an exam saying, or oh, why do you think, how do you think they're adapted for like keeping water? That's an option. So yeah. Have a brilliant really long loop of Henley. <laughs> A long leave and only. <laughs> of the subject of um, water retention um, and, and how water is really important for the kidney. And Thule, you mentioned that dehydration might cause an, a kidney injury. Do you just want to talk through how that one works quickly? Because it's not entirely obvious. Yeah, sure. So if we... Um, it. So I mentioned it briefly. Um, if you dehydrate, you basically... Let me go back to Starling's principle. So if we dehydrate, so we're losing volume, right? So if we lose volume, we lose pressure. So if we lose pressure in, in this blood, we're actually going to reduce that pressure in this filtration system here, uh, which means you're not going to get as much filtering out of the into the um, into the nephron. So it kind of damages the kidney because it, it, it basically ruins this mechanism and you're not going to get um, as much perfusion to the kidney, you don't get much as much filtration through. So you you basically retain your waste products, um, which isn't great. Uh, so that's why if you measured like creatinine, if you if you were really dehydrated, your creatinine will probably be quite high uh, because you're you're retaining that creatinine that uh, needs to be released. But yeah, I hope that makes sense. So effectively not having enough blood pressure is like turning down the tap. Yeah. And then you've not got, um, you can't push stuff through the those filtration layers. You, you can't create the filtrate at the beginning of the kidney. Um, so it kind of, the whole process stops working. 